Good evening, LCM. Good evening. Tonight is Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. What a glorious evening that we're already having together. That's true. Celebration on the left, celebration on the right, and it is going to continue. Amen. You know, Sunday was a moment of celebration, celebrating a declaration of war. We had people baptized in water, making a declaration of war to the heavenly realms of their joining of Yeshua, Hamashiach. Yeah. And there's also baptisms of the spirit that were happening on Sunday morning. Come on. That empowerment to go to war as you made a declaration of it. Did y'all have a good time on Sunday? Yeah. Oh, but it gets even better. Church, in this very evening, you have witnessed a testimony of miraculous healing in Cassidy P. Rowe. Yes! Yeah. See, just because you didn't know that there was some struggles going on doesn't mean that it's not an incredible miracle that took place and celebrating what God is doing right here in our midst. Can you, can you relate to that, Randy? Some miracles? Can you guys relate to miracles in this place? Yes. Oh, we just witnessed another miracle. The Dang family is having another baby. Come on, Dangs. That's what we need. We need another Dang offspring in this world to go conquer for the kingdom. Look, what we are witnessing in this church is evidence of the miraculous in our midst. Miracles are abounding. They're surrounding everything that we are and everything that we do. Can you say that God is with us? God is with us. Amen. We will eventually move beyond our sermon series, Ancient Paths. But we will never leave the ancient path that he has set us on. We're able to have faith in who God is what he's doing in our midst, and what he will lead us to fully accomplish. This faith that we have gives us reason for great confidence. And we have something to tell you about that. Come on, somebody say confidence. confidence. Turn with us to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 1. Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Somebody say ancient path when you get there. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. Faith is actually seen in your confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not yet see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Church, there is reason for confidence in this house tonight. The Lord has proven faithful to us since the very beginning. The very beginning of this church, the very beginning of this series, the very beginning of this evening, the very beginning God has been faithful. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Are you like me and you need to be reminded of that at times? I tend to go from one thing to the next, from one thing to the next, from one thing to the next, and my wife is over there grinning and saying, mm-hmm. But the idea of what God is doing in our midst should not be minimized. It should not be overlooked. And we need to celebrate what God is doing in this place. God's miracles are a testimony that should give you, that should give me full assurance of what we do not yet see. Has anybody got promises that you haven't seen yet fulfilled? Yeah. But do you have promises that have been fulfilled? Yeah. See, then that should give you confidence. Because you can trust in what he has done and what he is yet to do. This is the attitude. Sometimes you got to have a little attitude. Turn to your neighbor and say, attitude. Turn to your other neighbor that you didn't want to have an attitude with and go, attitude. Let me tell you the right attitude to have. Let me give you the right perspective on this. The attitude that the ancients were commended for was to have a faith that produced confidence, that produced assurance, and it didn't require them to see it. They were able to entrust themselves to the Lord. The title of tonight's sermon, for all of you note takers, is The Ancient Path of Faith. The Ancient Path of Faith. Oh, Pastor. Our study of this very passage needs some more amplification. I mean, we've, we've had attitude. Now we want some amplification. In fact, let's take a look at Hebrews 11, 1 through 2 in the amplified version. Amplified. Oh, yeah. Hebrews 11, 1 through 2 in amplified. Now, faith is the assurance or the confirmation or title deed. 
of things we hope for, being proof of what we do not see, and the conviction of their reality. Meaning faith perceived as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. For by faith, meaning trust and holy fervor born of faith, the men of old had divine testimony born to them and obtained a good report. Is that an amplified understanding of that passage? Well, it begins with declaring what faith is. It is the confirmation. It is the title deed in hand of what we hope for. Everybody, hold up your left hand. Feel that title deed in it right now. That feeling, that assurance of reality is the same reality of God's kingdom being given to you. It is the same authority that he's given to you. It is a constant confirmation that he is with you because you are walking in trust, grounded obedience to him. This is like Jeremiah. If you know the story of Jeremiah, he is given a word from the Lord to go and buy a piece of property, to have a title deed. Two copies were given. And it was an assurance, a confirmation of what God would do after the captivity and what was promised to him would come to him eventually. It was a reality in his hands. It established a conviction of what he did not see. It's a conviction of what you don't see. It's having the faith to perceive as real fact of what is not revealed to the natural senses. Man, how many of us need that tangible evidence of reality of God's kingdom that supersedes the natural existence? I do. But this is my favorite part of this amplified version. For by faith, meaning trust and holy fervor, born of faith. Man, what should be the evidence that we have faith, that we have trust, grounded obedience? It is going to demonstrate itself with action and with holy fervor. I'm talking about a tenacity that will not give up because it has the reality within its hands. Man, when you have something made real to you by the king of kings, nothing can stop you until you have fully accomplished it. Come on now. Isn't that a, something that we need to grab hold of tonight? This idea that you shouldn't need to see it. For you to treat it as if it is reality now without being able to see it, without being able to hear it fully manifest and trusting in the Lord so that your obedience is seen. Woo! Yeah. That's what the ancients were commended for, church. Yeah. And that's what we want you to be commended for tonight. This idea. Let's all turn to John chapter 6 and verse 40. We are establishing these. We are establishing these principles tonight and we're going to walk with you on a path. We're going to help explain to you what this ancient path that we've been on for quite a while now, but we feel the Lord's favor upon us tonight. We feel him moving and saying, this is the pathway that you were on. John chapter 6 and verse 40. Someone say faith when you get there. Faith. It says this, for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up in that last day. What does it look like for you to walk on the ancient path of faith? What does that look like? What has God put us on? He's put us on an understanding of what the Father's will is. What the Lord has been speaking to us for a long time now is His telling you what His will is. He's setting you on a path. Boy, isn't that a good thought that, God, that you can actually know the will of the Father? Yes. Wow, that was a lackluster answer. Isn't it something important to know that you can know the will of the Father? Yes. Have you become so accustomed to knowing the will of the Father that it's no longer precious to you? This is incredible. Can anybody remember a day when you weren't here, when you had to guess at what the Father's will is? I do. I was hoping. I, I was longing. But I didn't know what the Father's will is. Church, I can tell you that he is making his will known to us in this place. He has given you an entire pathway to know what his will is. The Father's will 
is for you to look upon the Son and have that full title deed in hand, hand conviction that the resurrection of power of God will raise you up at the last day. But it gets better. It's the Father's will for you to look upon the Son and know that the resurrection power is not just for the last day, but you need it today. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. you got to have the resurrection power every day, and you can know that that's actually God's will for you. Let's not pretend like you're alive for any other reason than his resurrection power. Is it working you every single day, connecting one breath to the next breath? It is the Father's will for you to look upon the Son in order for you to be able to complete His will on this earth. My goodness, He's put you on a path so you can know His will and so you could do His will. Because it's the Father's will that has been established. It is firmly established. He who is called the end from the beginning. But His will is really only for those who are sons. Somebody say sons. Sons. The will of the Father is for the sons and the daughters in this house. That's why he's called the Father. It's so we know how to relate to him. And he wants sons who will do the work of what his will is. Somebody say, do the work. Do the work. You see, God's will is always the next step of finding God's will is always that you're assigned a work to do. The idea that we just can get to know the will of God without then stepping into a work is not how real Christianity works. It is not the Father's will. But you're a church that's walking in the path of faith that shows you exactly what the Father's will is. Amen. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah! Oh man, I am proud to be in a house and a family with people that hunger to know what God's will is. That hunger for the ancient path of faith that is the Father's will. In fact, speaking of hunger, it goes right to a, a very connected item for me. Many times, I'm, I'll say every day. <laughs> yeah, let's just be real. As a father, I have a will for what I would like to eat for dinner. There is a food that I would like to partake of. And I extend my will to my family and particularly my girls. My girls are learning to become excellent easers. And they learn that becoming excellent easers to their father first. And particularly by doing the father's will. Now, is it good enough for me just to look at Sydney and say, Hey, Sid, tonight I want to eat butter chicken. And Sydney do nothing? No. Sydney's got work to do. Because I got food to eat. <laughs> That's how this equation is put together. And in doing the Father's will, there is resurrection power for Sydney. The impartation of his spirit to help her get up in the morning. So, everybody turn to John chapter 4, and we're going to read a verse on 31. I thought you were going to say, you allow her to keep living. <laughs> That's what you... I thought I'd keep it light and easy. John 4, 31. Meanwhile... His disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. All right. This is going to be one of those moments when you place yourself in the feet or the shoes of the disciples in response here. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? <laughs> Think on a very natural sensory level. Jesus replies, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish the work. Meaning the very substance that gives him life is to know and do the will of the Father and finish the work that is attached to that will. What's going to feed your spirit? What in, invigorates your soul every single day? It's knowing the will of the Father and then getting about to the work that's attached to it and not stopping in that work until it's done. You know what a good day is? A good day is a day that is full of his will and full of his work that's taking his supernatural power to accomplish it. And I crash into the bed and say, yes, Lord, this is feeding my soul. What are we going to do tomorrow? There's more work to do. So if 
Jesus has this as his food, well, what should be our food? It's to do the will of the Father and continue to do it until the work is finished. Come on now. The idea that a successful day is you completing the will of the Father through your work in that moment. Come on, what if we measured about uh, our success in a given day, not by the task that you achieved, mm -hmm. but by did you complete your mezuzah today? Yeah. Did you function in a family banner today? Did you do what the Father told you to or not today? Yeah. I don't just mean globally. I don't mean it's somewhere off. In the I mean like right today. Did you do what the Father told you to do today? Because he's got a will and that puts you to work. Look at John chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 16 and 17. Say path of faith when you get there. John 5, 16 says, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the, Jew the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. <laughs> the one who made the Sabbath. They're, 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 he, these people are trying to get him in trouble. The one who created it. Verse 17, in his defense, Jesus said to them, you ready for this defense? From Jesus, my father is always at his work. To this very day. And I too am working. What, sh what should we take from this passage? The Father God is always at work. That's the Peshat in case you're wondering. That's exactly what it says in the plain text. If you look at it in the Greek, it says exactly the same thing. And Jesus too is always at work. See, this gives us the right kind of understanding of what the Father's will is, of what the Father's work is. This is the path that we're on, is that God has a work and is unceasing. He is constantly at work. You have a view of God just sitting on a throne somewhere like a Zeus figure stuck in your mind? This passage in Jesus' own verbiage and his, from his own mouth says, The Father is always at his work, and I too am always working. Why? Because there is a glory in you finding exactly what God's will is and then getting about doing it. My goodness, that we could accomplish God's will every day because we are working at it. We, yeah. are, we are using his strength and going after what he's got. And nothing else can satiate. Nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else can feed us quite the way that accomplishing the work of God does for us. Now, let's look at John 10 to see how this continues. It's the ancient path of faith when you get there. Verse 37. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. That is a bold demonstration of trust and holy fervor born out of faith. Man, that, that's a declaration of absolute certainty. Don't believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe in me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. The means by which other people see your relationship with the Father is seen in you doing the works of the Father. So therefore, the importance of knowing his will is everything because his will sets the course for the works that you're going to do. And so much that you can have the same level of boldness and surety that, hey, don't believe me unless you see me doing exactly what the Father's doing. And even if you don't believe me, look at what we do. You know, that has been our stance for uh, since the beginning of the, this ministry. You want to throw rocks at us in our way of life. You want to call us a cult and say that we're messing up our children's minds and steering our life off course. Look at the works that are demonstrated in our, hand, our, our households. Look at our marriages. Look at our children. Look at our way of life. Look at the miracles that keep happening again and again. If you don't believe me, believe the works that are happening in this house. It gives validation that the Father is with us and that we are found in the Father. This is something that we can celebrate today. This is why we preach to you the way we do. This is why we encourage you. This is why we challenge you the way that we do. You can see our lives and know whether we're about the work of the Father or not. We are on display for you. Good, bad, ugly, and otherwise, our lives are on display. And that's been one of the things that drew me to this church long before I ever got here was I could look at the Stevens family and see, you can maybe not like them, but you have to respect the fact that they are doing the work of the Lord. 
And by the way, I love them more than my words can ever express. Amen. The entire lot of them. All hundred of the little Stevens as they're stair-stepping down. I can look at the p and I can see people who are about the work of the Father. Amen. I can see miracles happening in their life. The p are glowing with God's presence. They get better all the time. How is that even possible? I don't know. They must be about the work of yes. the Father. Amen. You can expect the exact same thing. I promise you, there's nothing particularly special about the Sutherlands. There's nothing particularly special about the Piros. We have both found the will of God and are now at work for Him, and this is what you get. Look at the elders. Yeah. Look at our lives. Think what you will. But Jesus, in this passage, the pastor just said, you don't have to believe us. Believe the work that comes from our lives. Amen. Amen. Come on, isn't that really the rub? Isn't that why some of you in this room are discouraged? It's because you don't think that you can do what we do. You're afraid that you're going to try and it's not going to work and your life won't prove it out. I think what you see, that was great. I don't know if you're not going to be able to hear it on the camera. Cassidy Piro just said, that's a bunch of lies. She's right. Those are lies that you can't do this. Yeah. If you actually go wholeheartedly into this, you see exactly what the church produces. I can walk around the room and point to you about people who've sold out to this, and you know this is true. That's not, oh, that's just the pastors. No, it's not. Oh, that's just the elders. No, it's not. We are building an entire church of people who know how to rise up to the challenge and say, God, you show me your will, and I'll get to work on it. Come on now, let's turn to Ephesians 2 together to see how this continues on. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. I'm so excited, I'm just going to start reading. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Now before you put your theological hat on, before you take, take us to Bible school or Bible college or cemetery, I mean seminary or whatever you came from, I like cemetery better than seminary anyway. you got to understand what this is saying to us. We're going to read this, and it's going to hit you in a new way tonight. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, through that trust-grounded obedience, through the same thing that the ancients were commended for, that kind of faith that takes it like you already got the title deed in hand, whether you can see it or not. Hmm. See, it's hard when your kids are little to believe that there's a title deed that God has already given you. It's hard for you to believe on your end of life when you got little ones that what we're saying in these stages is actually going to bring life and it's going to produce exactly what we are. It is going to produce in your family. You will be able to replicate it even better because we're getting better at this. We're getting better at this. What you see, the fruit from the pastor's lives, it's, we didn't even have what you have right now. We didn't know what we knew. We were trusting in the Lord and he was helping us and we still got to this point. How much better are you going to be? You can do this. Why? That's gonna, it's just going to take some faith in the work of God. And this is not from yourselves. That's the easy part for me to believe. Yeah, it's not from myself. I promise you I know that part. It is the gift of God. Somebody say gift. Oh, a God who gives good gifts. That's incredible. Not by works so that anyone can boast. Now, so many theologians have mucked up the waters on this. Not by works. That means that we don't have to work. Look at the next words. Just keep reading. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The whole point of you being created is to do good works. Amen. The point is, is it's not about your works in the salvation, so you think it's about you. It's finding the will of the Father and getting after the work. That's actually what faith looks like. Yeah. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. What is your point here on this earth? Theologians will tell you it's to worship Jesus. <laughs> Lies. The point of, 
of it is for you to find God's will, which he will show you, and you to get after the work. He's always working. Jesus is always working. Hmm, I'm noticing a pattern. I wonder what I should be doing. You should be working. Because you were created for it, which God prepared in advance for you. It's not like he didn't know you were coming along. He had this already in motion. He had his plan. you got to have a little faith in what he's telling you to do. The ancient path of faith, it leads you to the Father's will so you can do the work. Turn to your neighbor and say, "Do do the work. You must do what the Father has prepared for you in advance to do. See, you don't have to do my work. I do. But you have to do your work. The work was prepared in advance. Do you know how you get prepared to do the work? Fivefold. The fivefold is here as a gift, speaking of gifts, to help you to be prepared For your works of service. Which, if I combine it with Ephesians 2, was prepared in advance for you to do. The works were prepared in advance. You are prepared as you do the work. I'm going to give it to you again. It's okay. It's a Wednesday night. Everybody's trying to catch up with us here. The works were prepared in advance for you to do. The fivefold is here to help you to be prepared as you do the work. Work was prepared before, you're prepared while you do the work. That's really, really good. It, I, I'm just telling you. It's, it's, it's really good. Let, let me share why this is really good. Mm. Get it. The reason that this point is so good is that because it crushes every bit of fear and lies inside of you, that try to disrupt and derail the reason why God put you in this church. God put you in this church to know how to find God's will and to know how to work. Why do our days look the way that they do that one day in LCM is a thousand days at another church? It's because we know the Father's will and He's good about doing our work. Come on, man. Think about Hebrews 11. Go ahead and turn there with me. It's, it's, worth, it's worth the trip to Hebrews. Let's put it this way. You can never know the will of God unless you're at work. If you have the will of God, it requires you to get to work. What does that mean about so many of the people that you've known before, though? What does that mean? Oh, let's, put it, let's not put it off on them. What, what does that mean about you? How many times have you said that you know the will of God but there's no work that comes from it. Your faith without works is dead. We're going to have some lively faith in this house, though. We're going to have some people commended for their faith. Hebrews 11. Let's go all the way down to 32 so I don't read the whole thing. Because I want to. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised. It's almost like they knew they had the title deed in hand before they could see it. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. By the way, how do you turn weakness to strength? you got to go work at it. Are you feeling me? What happens when God puts you in situations that are stretching to you? He doesn't put you in situations that are stretching by putting you in stuff that you can already do. If he's entrusting you with something that's stretching, that means he's making you rep something you are weak at. So you can become strong. Amen. I'm letting it sit in on you. Because what do we like to do? We like to do the stuff we're already good at. 
Oh, Lord, stretch me. No, no, Lord, put me right where I can do everything that I need to do really, really well. If I were going to be honest about the way that I feel, that's more my prayers. But because he loves us and he's got a will for you to get to work, he'll make you do things that you're not very good at. Over and over and over. Has anybody felt that any time lately? Pastor, this is too hard to, to get my family in order. It's too hard of what you got me doing at work. It's too hard of what, me got, what you want me to do with my kids. Yep. Welcome to getting strong, people. Amen. Come on, treat it like a title deed in hand. Come on, Sosas. That's what I'm talking about. Whose weakness was turned to strength. Let's have a little faith that if you can't do it all right now, that God can help and strengthen you. Let's have the, a kind of faith that you can be commended for, that you don't crumble and start to doubt and start biting your nails because you can't already do it. If you could already do it, why would you need him to help you? Huh. Ray just gave me a huh. Whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in the battle. Isn't that really it? Yes. We, want to have our weakness, uh, we want to have our strengths turn to glory. And we want to be strong before we enter the battle. Wow. That's true. Yeah. That's true. We want our strengths to become our own glory. And we want to be strong before we enter the battle. This is why we need 117 confirmations before we do what the Lord told us to do. This is why we're not transparent with each other, because we think that everyone else should think that we already have it all together. I promise you, everybody else has already got that notion. They know what you're not good at anyway. You're hiding it from yourself. <laughs> yep. Okay, in case you don't think I'm right, get them. Have you looked at other people in this room? Notice weaknesses in them and just kept it to yourself even while they're trying to posture that they're doing good? Have you? Yes or no? But nobody's doing that to you? You're the only one with that depth of perception. So how about we stop wanting to pretend like we have no weaknesses? How about you let your weaknesses be turned to strength by being transparent with each other? Yeah. How about you know that when it's when you get in the battle that you are made strong? Yeah. You can get in the battle. Don't wait till you got it all together. If you wait for God to speak to you 100% before you do something, you ain't never going to do nothing. Because you're going to take out away the need for faith that the ancients were commended for. That's exactly it. Speaking of battle. It's time to talk about the battle. See, God has got his will that he has given to this house. He's telling us to get to work. That's how you become strong. Oh, I can't do it. Well, good. Keep doing it. Si, si puede. <laughs> get about the work because as you're going about the work, you know what it's always going to lead you to? The war that God wants you to fight. Come on, turn with us to Exodus 17. We're going to start with verse 13. It's an ancient path of faith when you get there. Are you getting something out of this message? Is it speaking to you? About you? Amen. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army. With the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So, wh what's happening here, right? We're in Exodus 17. See, Moses is walking on the ancient path of faith. And you know what he's doing? He's raising up that staff, that title deed of faith above his head. He has support on his left and right with Aaron and her to uphold that staff. 
so that Joshua could win the war. See, the will of the Father is being made known to you about your life so that you would get about the work that's supposed to fulfill that will. And God has destined for you to contend with his enemies, but it extends even into your generations. What your faith can do for the victories of your disciples. What your faith can do for your children that are overcoming their fears today. And you watching them get victory because you're holding up your title deed in the heavenly realms. Amen. And he commands them to have a scroll of remembrance. And that scroll of remembrance was written for the current generation. Able to serve as an immediate documentation of victory. Every day we are looking into the living and active word of God because it is a scroll of remembrance. It is the ability for us to look at God's victories in the past, recount his victories that he's done for us, be encouraged about our present, and have the victory attitude of what's coming up in the future. You ever been around somebody who just can't get discouraged in the moment? That their heart and their attitude is so connected with the heart of the Father, it doesn't matter what kind of news comes their way, they're bringing up the fact of how superior and great God is despite it. It challenges your heart a little bit in the moment, doesn't it? Why aren't you upset like I am? Would you please have less faith and make me feel better? But instead, it's infectious. It begins to have an escalation that allows you to gain the same level of confidence, assurance, that trust and holy fervor born out of faith that exalts the standard of God above all other standards. You begin to see victories in other people's lives because of your showing of trust, grounded obedience and what God has said to do. Well, this entire scenario continues with verse 15. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war. Oh, you mean that battle didn't just end that day with the Amalekites? No, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. This is a generational battle. God's will from the very beginning, that ancient path of faith, destined that it would take place in your generation, but it would take your generations to complete it. Moses built an altar of victory to serve as a sign that the Lord will be at war with his enemies from generation to generation, passing down to them the responsibility to continue on the ancient path of faith that goes to war with God's enemies. You know what we're training our children in this house to do? How to take down the giants that we are currently taking down. Amen. That's going to equip them and make them battle ready for the giants that they're going to face. See, this is the beginning of Joshua's, uh, it's his introduction in the scripture. You see him introduced as a warrior. We're going to see how he transitions. Let's go to Numbers chapter 27 and look at verse 22. You're going to see how he's transitioning into leadership and it's going to show us another important piece of this war story that we're on. It says this in Numbers 27, 22. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord instructed through Moses. Just like a faithful father, Moses is fully obedient to the will of God, the work of God. Why? So that Joshua can go to war just like his God. Like a faithful father, this is done before the Lord. This is done before the high priest. And this is done before all of the people. This is not done in a, in a corner somewhere. This is not done fighting some secret battle somewhere. This is done out in the open. Because it's the very nature of our God. Why? Because the war is going to include everybody. This war includes all of us. It's not your own private battles. There is a war that we as a family are engaging in. Yeah. 
He's not just a commanding officer. He's not just a general. He's not only a king. He is our father. And he wants us to go to war. How much do you think he's going to equip you if he's wanting his own sons and daughters to go to war? How much do you think he's going to fight for you when you know that he's the father that's sending you out to war? You're not some conscripted army. Easy for me to say. You're not some conscripted army. You are the very children, the son, soldiers of our mighty God. It's almost like this is a further declaration of war. It's almost like baptism is a start of a declaration of war. And then you get trained so that you can go to war as a son soldier. Like a faithful father, father leading his son on the ancient path of faith, he gets hands laid upon Joshua. Come on, war always requires the impartation and empowerment of authority from the Father. That's what laying hands is all about, is you getting an impartation of the very authority from the heavens. See, war requires that all of God's enemies be destroyed, and that is what we are after. We won't leave one stone unturned. We won't leave one enemy undefeated because we are going after it because we are the sons and we have been imparted something special, a level of faith, a level of power, a level of authority that God is giving us. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Let's see this demonstrated in the reason for his son being here. Go to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 7. <laughs> War. This is a letter written by John in the voice of a father speaking to his children. And he's letting, letting them know this. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. I like the straightforward nature of John. Yeah, me too. The reason the Son of God appeared was to make me happy. No. No. The reason the Son of God appeared was for my best life now. No, no. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. We're on the topic of war tonight. Okay. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Yeah. That's Peshatli stated. Come on. Like Joshua, Jesus has been handed the responsibility of accomplishing the Father's will by completing the Father's work and thereby going to war against the enemies that his Father has. He's finishing his Father's work. By destroying all of the devil's work. This demonstrates something for us. It demonstrates the clarity of the ancient path of faith that we must travel on. More plainly put, you cannot have the expectation of being free from war when you're doing the will of the Father. Right? There is no such thing as a Christian who has the Sweden aspect of World War II. You're not neutral in this battle. You have to pick one side or the other. But wouldn't you rather pick the side that has God Almighty? The one that is Yahweh Sabaoth and has demonstrated his love for you by sending his son to war for you. And that by joining his son, you're also being joined by the armies of heaven with you. Man, we have the ultimate reason to have confidence and faith, to have trust and holy fervor because of the strength of our God that is with us. We stand today celebrating victories that God has already done. And guess what? There are more victories yet to be had. Let's all turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to begin it in verse 1. 2 Timothy 2, 1. Get there quickly and say ancient path of faith when you're there. It says this, you then, my son, here's another father speaking to a son. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard from me say, heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering. 
Amen. Like a good soldier in Christ. Yeah. Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affair, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Man, that's a good word for us tonight. Yeah, it is. See, you got to understand some, some things, church. That you can know the will of God and it's going to put you on the path of finding the work of God. But the work of God is always going to lead you to the war that God has initiated and that God is leading us to fight. Amen. You can't get away from this path. You can't skip a step. You can't get no. on this path from some other way. you got to begin at the beginning and walk your way right on up to the war. But what is the war designed to do? The war, can you imagine in an actual physical war? Tell me about your prayer life in an actual physical war. Tell me about your prayer life as you're engaging with the war that God has for you to fight. Mm. See, you become like him when you're walking and understand his will. When you know the Father's will, you become more like him. When you got, get about the work that the Father has for you, you become more like him. When you go to war, you become more like him. This is the point of what we're doing, is we're ever increasing. We're ever becoming more like him. Starts off with his will. It goes about the work. It has got to be developed in the war. But that's not even the best part yet. The best part of this is that if we're going to be like the ancients, commended for our kind of faith, we have to understand that this process of his will, getting us to work and going to war, there's only one better way to become like God. And that's through a wedding so that we might become exactly like him. Turn with us to Revelation chapter 1. As you're turning there, doesn't it turn the tide in your own heart when you know what you're fighting for? You have a clear goal. What is all this war? What is all this suffering for? It's for the purpose of a wedding. Begins with Revelation 1 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Rightly understanding the ancient path of faith requires revelation from Jesus. It requires revelation from his son. This is how you begin to know the will of the father that directs everything after it. The father has chosen his son to give you revelation of his will, to give you empowerment to do his work, to give you the might and strength to join and win his war. So that you, his church, can become exactly like him. Why did Jesus go to the war or go to war to the extent that he did? It's because he had a bride that he was after. Look, this is the very reason why he also delivered his people out of Egypt. We've often said at this church from the very beginning that the entirety of the Bible can be summed up in two concepts. It is a war story, and it is a wedding story. Yep. You see one of these two aspects throughout the entirety of the word, and actually sometimes you see it as a, war, a wedding that turns into a war that is for the purpose of a wedding. You can actually see this throughout the word of God. During their deliverance, Israel, why were they brought out of Egypt? so that God could marry them there on Mount Sinai. See, there was war that had to take place so that they could get to a wedding. Yeah. You have to be able to fight rightly to be able yeah. to get to the wedding, which the point of the wedding is for you to become exactly like your groom. That was a good place for you ladies. The goal of a wedding is so that you become exactly Amen. like your groom. Amen. There you go. Now we're getting some godly answers in this house. The goal for us as Christians is to become exactly like our groom. Yeah. 
This is exactly what we're doing. And during the deliverance, Israel was even able to receive plunder. Everybody say plunder. Plunder. It's almost like God was getting ready to give them wedding gifts. Plunder. Let me just read this for you. Exodus 12, 36. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people. And they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. God had a built-in wedding gift. The wedding gift registry was right there for them. They said, yes, I want that from you. And the Egyptians said, please just take it and get out. Much of the way we all feel at at any particular way. Yes, here, just take the gifts and go. This is what was going on here. That's just me. Sorry, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) church haven't we received some incredible wedding gifts some incredible plunder here in this house yes we're going to talk to you just for a minute about what god has given this house the kind of plunder that has come into this house of lcm y'all get y'all got to get ready buckle up for this because you're going to enjoy this look throwing it way back to the year of 2004 we're in our first garage sanctuary. It's about a, an eighth of the size of this room. This was a time period where God was giving us plunder. He's giving us wedding gifts by sending us young men that would rise to the call of God on their life. That would join us in the revelation of the will of God. Join us in the work of God. Join us in the war of God. Come on. And you know where they are right now? They're pastors of the One Association. I mean, God gave gifts to men. He gave us fivefold ministers that were born from this house as the first fruits of this ministry. It's like what is spoken in Ephesians 4 is absolutely true as it quotes Psalm 68. And he gave gifts to men. Giving us exactly what this house needed to find the further encouragement to continue in his will. See, sometimes you think that what you have right now is what it's always been. But that is not what has happened here in this house. No. It's not like this, was, this place was built and just handed over to somebody. This place has been built and scratched from the earth. Yes. There have been pastors that have come from this house. You should be encouraged, men and men of this house who are fivefold and called to the fivefold. This house can produce fivefold ministers. You know what else we could produce? We could produce elders. When we started this work, God, we were craving elders. We were craving those who could come alongside of us and speak to us. And look what God gave us. God gave us Charlie Brown. Yeah. God gave us a man who has been faithful in the kingdom for longer than I can care to mention. But he was brought here and given as a gift to this house. Has anybody else, has anybody in this place received the gift of Charlie Brown into your life? Yes. Come on, think about John Dang. Speaking of crawfish boils, ask him about his testimony about the first time that he showed up to a crawfish boil here. John Dang. An elder in this house got saved in this house, got spirit filled in this house, got discipled in this house, and now he's helping to lead this house. What about you? Where you come from? I promise you, this church knows how to raise up. Oh my goodness. We can raise up some elders in this house. Anybody been blessed by the gift that John Dang is in your life? Yes. Think about Baj Erigina. Think about the gift that this man is. Do you know what he did when he got here? He didn't stand on all the accomplishments of his past, and he could have tried to do that. What Baj did was say, huh, my son has just received something from the Lord, and I want what he's got. I'm going after that, and I will let everything else, I'll act as if I know nothing. Everything, I counted all this refuse, only that I might know the Lord and know what this place has. And he threw it all away and got invested in what God has here. Amen. Has anybody been blessed by the gift that is Baja Regina? Yeah. God brings what he needs. He's brought pastors. He's brought pillars from this house. He can do it. He's done it before and he could surely do it again and he can do it in you. 
you know, just recounting history of LCM, we've known difficult days. We've known what it's like to be in need. And I don't just mean in finances. I mean before John Day, before Bosch, before Charlie got here, before there were young men that were going to be raised up to be pastors of the One Association, before there was healings, and we were going through very difficult days. We know what it's like to be in need, but you know what we've never lacked? We've never lacked the abundant lavishing of wedding gifts that God has given us. Every year that goes by, I watch that lavishing get more and more and more to a greater level. God's going to keep adding to our family men and women of God who respond to this call and who participate with us in being the wedding gifts of God. See, this is supposed to remind you that if God has done it, he can do it again. You just need a little yeah. faith. You just need to get about the will of the Lord and get to the work of the Lord and get to the war of the Lord so that you can find the wedding and let him do it again in you. Amen. See, we've watched marriages materialize in this house yeah. as if gifted from the heavens right into our midst. I got, we got a whole row over here of people that this relates to. We've seen marriages healed. We've seen marriages strengthened. We've seen marriages turn around from pitiful excuses into powerhouses for the very king of kings. Yeah. Established and founded on ancient past. He's done it before. He can do it again. Yeah. He can do it inside of you. Amen. And he will do it inside of you as you walk along this path of faith. All the saying is true. First comes love. Then comes marriage. Then comes the next couple of LCM with a baby in the baby carriage. <laughs> You know what we, we're standing on now is evidence of God's wedding gifts of children in this house. The loss of children has been far surpassed. That number has been swallowed up by the children that we now possess. We're almost complete in filling the entire top row of our, our altar with children before we preach. We need to add more to that second row. I want to see the abundance of wedding gifts, the abundance of plunder that God is giving us because it's victory after victory after victory. We're living in a fruitful time. Come on. I've, I've, I've completely lost count how many kids we have in our church. I just know it's a lot. <laughs> it's like at that point when, you know, three days after your honeymoon, you get back. It's like, how many wedding gifts did we get? I don't know. It's just a lot. I can't move anywhere in my apartment. Church, if he's done it before, you need to have some faith that he can do it again and do it in you. Yeah. He's done it before. He's done it time and time and time and time again. He can do it again for you. Yeah. See, we're the kind of church that learned how to be faithful with the few. Yeah. The few resources, the few people. And what has God done? That little has, has multiplied. Yeah. There's been a multiplication of revelation in this house. Anybody blessed by the revelation of this house? Yes. Abundance. It is an abundance of revelation in this house. You should be really, really thankful that you're here at a time where there is an abundance of real brotherhood. Yeah. My goodness, Amen. to just do this by yourself, no one should have to do that. No. Oh, any individual with the Holy Spirit, you're not at a disadvantage. But you, what kind of advantage is it when you have actual brothers who are walking alongside Amen. and can do this with you? The idea that God has turned the little and the resources into much. That he's redeemed families in this place that is better. The families that we've given up. This family, I promise, is a much better family. Can somebody say amen? amen? Whatever you give up, the Lord is multiplying it here in this house. And he's pouring amen. it back upon you so that you might become like him. It's almost like you have to remember that, that God's path led you through the sea, led you through the sea, you, through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. Sometimes you can't always see the footprints in front of you. You've got to turn around and realize that God had this path of his will leading to his work so you can fight his war, so you can get to the wedding. You can become just like him. That's what this is about. This is the path that led Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And it's going to be what leads you tonight. Church, he did it before. Have some faith. Have some faith that can be commended in this house like the ancients. 
that doesn't require it to be seen. If we would have waited until things were seen, it would have never happened in this house. Amen. But because your leaders were men who said, we're going to believe it like it's here, even though it's not here yet. Yeah. Let that faith rise within you today, and let's understand what the Lord is doing in our midst. To see that, let's culminate it here in Exodus chapter 6. Turn to Exodus 6. We'll pick up in verse 6. <laughs> Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Church, we're, we're very familiar with this passage. We know it from our maximizing marriages teaching. This is where we establish the presence of the four cups, the four promises that a groom makes to a bride. But tonight, we want to bring to light that this declaration from the Lord in Exodus 6 was given prior to the plagues of Egypt. It was prior to the crossing of the Red Sea. The Lord was declaring the intentions of his ancient path of faith from the very beginning. And we have something to help you understand it. We want to show you this slide as we begin to close. We've been talking about finding the very will of God. The very will of God is to bring you out from under where you were, to bring you out of Egypt. God, that is God's will is that he has taken us out that put them to work. See, before they were slaves, he says, I'm going to free you from being slaves. I'm going to change the kind of work that you do. Amen. No longer will you be slave to the things of this world, to your own carnal desires, to your own fears, to your own selfish ambitions. I'm going to free you from that work, and I'm going to put you to work for my kingdom, for something that will have lasting results. When he says, I will redeem you, Boy, we love that part, don't we? Man, he's going to redeem us. How did he redeem his people? How did he redeem his bride? He said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of warfare. Yeah. That's how our God does this. He did it with his people, and he promised it to them. He said it in advance what he was going to do. And he says, I'm going to take you as my own. And that is exactly what he did by the time we get to Exodus 19. This is the pathway that God led. And he was saying, my people, you got to have faith that this is what I'm walking you towards is a wedding story. I am walking you in my will to take you out. I'm going to give you work, not like what you had before. I'm going to cause you to go to war because that's what I'm doing so I can take you to be with me. Church, we are all about going to war. But you have to remember why you're going to war. So you can be with him. He wants to be with you. He is drawing you. This is the pathway to his side. And to show you that, look at Revelation chapter 19. We'll start in verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! 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 For the, our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. What is the warrior king riding on that white horse rejoicing about? His bride is ready. Come on. And he's going to go get her. What have we walked you through tonight? It's the very ancient path of faith that the heavenly father has set in order for you to make yourself ready. To make yourself ready for this wedding of the Lamb. 
Man, we are calling you to remember through his word, through his scroll of remembrance, the way in which he has revealed his will to you. The way in which he has prepared his work for you. And the way in which he is leading you into his war. And the way in which he is also making you ready for his wedding. I want to ask a question. And I want you to respond. Tonight, are there saints in this house who join the call to joyfully walk on this ancient path of faith? Yeah. Are there saints who will desire to know the will of their father? Yeah. Are there saints who will do the work of the father? Yeah. Are there saints who will go to war alongside of the father? Amen. Then there is the promise that you will join in that wedding of the lamb. We have such a good father. We have such a good father who puts us on such a clear path. Part of the blessing of being a pastor here in this church is that I feel like a father to some of you. I've learned how, and it is crystal clear to me, I know exactly how to treat every man and woman and child in this room. I treat you like my family. I treat you as brothers. I treat our elders as fathers. I treat the young men as sons. I want to ask a young man who is like my son to come to the stage at this time. Timothy Carter, come up here. Come stand beside me. Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7 says this. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. You know what? Why don't I have you read this? Okay, why don't you read this first? Well, in Exodus 6, 6 through 7, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will, you know what? In order to do this next part, I'm going to need to ask my lovely friend to come and join me. <laughs> Got to do it right. In verse 7, it says, I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt from out under the yoke of the Egyptians. Baby, I want you to become my people. I want to take you as my own. You've been my friend for half of my life, and I want to spend the rest of my life with you, teaching others as we ourselves leave what is behind and strain towards hope, sacrifice, and life. This is my promise to you. We will relentlessly pursue the Lord. And I, with a relentless passion, will pursue you for the rest of my life. Everything, everything, darling, that I have hoped for and desired and dreamed of in a wife and a spouse, Malaika, you are all and you are more. And so I want to take you to be mine and I am asking you, I'm asking you to be my wife. I'm asking you to become my beloved. Olivia Joy, will you marry me? to continue to celebrate here in just a minute. There's no better lesson than you can see than lives that are fulfilling exactly what we're saying. These two love the Lord with all their heart. 
they're called into ministry. Their future, the trajectory of their life is to be in ministry. They have been brought up in this house, saved, spirit-filled, discipled here in this house. And this is the product. This is so special. This is so special. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to invite the rest of the family up. I got something for you too, though. We've got something for you. Tonight, what's the kind of response that we should have? Oh, I know about them. That's celebratory. What's the kind of response that you need to have tonight? You need to demonstrate some faith. And how are you going to demonstrate some faith? By actually having a little joy. By actually trusting that the Lord can do in you and for you what he's done for others. We're going to rejoice tonight. Can somebody say amen? Come on, can you do better than that? We can rejoice tonight. Come on, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to have a spirit of rejoicing. And we're going to let this show that we have the faith that can be commended. Like the ancients. Mighty God, we thank you. We love you so much, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love to us. We thank you of what you're doing in our midst, raising holy, pure young men and women who can celebrate about what you have done in Jesus' name.